Hello and welcome. My name is Kelly Sockwell. I'm CEO and Technical Director of Phoenix Industries. Here today with Rachel, who's going to be helping out a little bit, chatting with you guys that might have any questions out there. So go ahead and start getting those in would be great. We're bringing you this uh, webinar here today because we've had so many questions and requests for information from many of our 3,600 plus uh, subscribers to our Tire Recycling Insight newsletter. And we feel this webinar will let us address many of those questions today kind of all at once here. And it looks like we have a pretty good online attendance today. Um, I'm told we have participants from over 50 countries, so that's, that's great. What we're going to cover today is just a quick uh, overview of the waste tire recycling process and some of the uses for the rubber generated from the recycled tires with a special emphasis on the, the, the rubber paving process as well we will touch on uh, some of our new technology for the pelletized asphalt rubber binder material. Also we will be making a video of this available through our website a, a little bit later on for those of you who couldn't be here uh, today. So with that we'll get started. Just a little about Phoenix Industries. We are a US based uh, company based in Las Vegas, Nevada. We design and fabricate waste tire recycling plants, rubber blending units, and also some other equipment for the asphalt industry. We have equipment in over uh, a dozen countries around the world at this time. This is a couple of shots of our, what we call our PI 3000 model waste tire recycling plant. This is a complete system to take whole car and truck tires all the way down uh, to a metal free and fiber free crumb rubber material that uh, is used uh, in, a, in a wide variety of products that we'll get into uh, a little bit later. Just a illustration of uh, plant layout you could see here uh, goes through several several stages steps the material all the way down to final bagging. This particular plant output for about three tons per hour and of course that depends on what size the material is that, uh, that the output material that you're producing. And we do have a question here uh, from Alberta, Canada. How many tires can your plant do per year? This plant uh, in a general configuration if you were running 24 hours a day five days per week with two of the shifts being production shifts you're going to do between about a million and a half and two million tires per year. And generally in that scenario the operation, uh, the production is going to be at night, the two night shifts, the day shift is generally going to be for shipping and receiving and cleanup and maintenance and that type of things. Basically what we get from waste tires in the recycling process, about 65 percent is the actual rubber material the balance of the tires made up of the steel and the fiber. Uh, obviously the, the crumb rubber, the rubber material, is the most value added product. The steel though, it does get recycled as well and is, uh, is a revenue stream also. The fiber, in many cases, um, uh, it's difficult to get rid of, uh, to find a good use for, but we have had some applications where the plant can use this, uh, ship this to a, a local biomass plant, uh, energy plant, where they use this for fuel to produce electricity. So in, in a scenario like that, we do recycle virtually 100% of the tire, of the waste tires. First step in the processing line is the shredding, where we're taking the whole car and truck tires in and uh, they go through a, a big shredder here, takes them down to just a, a rough shred. Uh, they're screened. Any of the oversized material after it goes through comes back up this return conveyor back into the shredder until it actually meets the size requirements and then it drops on down here and goes on into the, the system. Uh, we have a question 
from Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, do you need to debead the truck tires? No, we take the whole car and truck tires all the way into, uh, into the system here. The next stop, uh, uh, next section along the way is what we call granulation, where we're taking that big rough shred that you saw in the previous slide that was produced, and we reduce it a little bit further down into size, something like this. Uh, typically about an 18 to 20 millimeter piece is what uh, we get from our granulation stations here. And at this point is where we start to clean the material up a little bit. Every time we step it down in size, we liberate a little bit more of the steel, a little bit more of the fiber out. You can see right here, this is an overbelt magnet uh, to, to pull some of the steel out. And uh, we do this at about six points along the way, remove the steel and the fiber we pull out with the duct system. You can see a couple of shots of some of the ductwork coming up here in the background. Uh, we pull the fiber out at about a dozen points along the way. And a question from oh, Samokovi. Uh, I'm sure I didn't get that right in Bulgaria. How much steel is left in the rubber? Typically, we, we get the rubber pretty clean. Um, most of the specifications require for 99.9% metal-free and 99.5% fiber-free materials. The next stop is milling. We do a two-stage milling, a primary and a secondary. Mills are hydraulically driven. We actually turn one roll at about 40 RPM and one roll at about 7 six or seven RPM, so we get a very high uh, friction ratio, very efficient that way. You could see just some of the shots of the ver a couple of the different sizes of material. This might be a size that would be used, uh, say, by FIFA in a sports field application, or this could be a typical size used uh, maybe in a uh, rubberized paving process. Just some shots of some of the other equipment. Uh, as the material moves down the line. This is a this dark uh, blue box right here is another magnet. We're pulling more steel out as it goes down. A screening unit here where we separate the sizes. The Any of the oversized drops out here and is pneumatically blown back and goes back through the system till it's the proper size. Uh, you can see on this vibrating table here, these hoods, this is another section where we're cleaning the material up a little bit more. Uh, as I said, we do this in about a dozen points along the way. Shot of our outside of our dust collection, our fiber collection and dust collection system. The fiber uh, typically drops out under the, uh, under the silo here uh, in this area and is gathered. The under the bag house, the dust, the rubber dust generally would drop out here, and the rubber dust goes right back into the system because that is a uh, uh, that's what we're striving for. The metal that comes out of the tires, as I said, it is a revenue stream. It can be baled. This is an optional baler that that we offer here. It can be baled. Uh, a little bit easier to handle the material that way, but generally speaking, most of the tire recyclers will take and just uh, ship this material loose back to uh, their, their local metal recycler. After the material is processed, it is bagged in the, in the one-ton super sacks here. Uh, this is a shot of a bagging station. You'd be filling one bag up and then when it's full you have a flop gate that would flop over and then this bag would start filling while the operator is changing this bag out. It's weighed, barcoded, uh, tagged uh, based on the, the size and, and what the material is. can be put in uh, shipped in trucks, uh, either vans or flatbeds or loaded in sea containers for international shipping. Our plant is capable with just uh, some quick uh, screen changes to do a wide variety of gradations, uh, just about any type you need. We could typically change a uh, size uh, production of material in about uh, one and a half, two hours, three hours, worst case, something like that. We always provide 
uh, sieve analysis equipment so that you know what type of equipment you're, you're producing because there are some very tight specifications, particularly if you're going to be selling into the world, uh, the world market. Now just a few things that can be done with the rubber uh, produced uh, from waste tires. All types of uh, different applications for it. You can see the rubber uh, Z-bricks that are used in the paving process here. It can be colorized just about any color you want. Uh, parking stops very popular here as well. Uh, this is interesting. This is a uh, roof uh, section uh, being done with, with the rubberized uh, the material made from waste tires, uh, very durable, very long lasting. Uh, some other products that you can do here. Just some shots of some of that. This is uh, the rubber pavers that are used here in kind of a municipal setting. Works great for municipalities like around swimming pools where the uh, where you have kids running and playing that type of things. It's definitely a safer surface to uh, to have activities on. Some other things you can do with it, it can be made into mulch, colored again, just about any color for mulch in garden areas, it retains water much better, moisture in the soil much better. Be used as playground material, you could see here, this happens to be behind the White House. This is our President, uh, U.S. President Obama and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. After the President moved in with his girls, they put this play area there behind the White House utilizing rubber made from uh, from waste tires. A couple of shots of some of the big items that are made with with crumb rubber. Uh, these are uh, railroad ties you could see here. Uh, no more using of wood. Uh, this is a much greener application for that. They hold up very good as well. There have been some reports even that it's easier on the train undercarriage and all of that because it does give just a little bit of cushion for the uh, for the train ride. These are some great big oil field mats where uh, when a company goes in to drill a well used to they would do this with timber as, as well, creosote type timber, but it's very expensive and very uh, not very green process at all. Now they do it with these mats made from the recycled rubber and they're able to uh, just when they're done, pick them up, move them off to the next project, reuse them. One of the largest uses of crumb rubber is in the sports field application. Uh, FIFA has a requirement for it, a specification for it, so does our US NFL, our baseball leagues, that type of things. Very widely used as an infill in a material. Again, generally have very tight specification requirements on this, so you need to make sure any plant you're putting in that does have uh, the capabilities of meeting the cleanliness and the gradation specifications for something like this. Uh, our company, we kind of uh, uh, promote and specialize in the using of the rubber produced from waste tires in the rubberized paving process. It's a uh, excellent material. It increases the quality. Obviously, it's good for the environment. It does create a safer surface to drive on, but uh, mainly it's just a, a very durable, long-lasting paving material. We have a few examples of some of that coming up. This is a project that was done many years ago in the state of Arizona, and you can see this picture's been, this is an interstate highway, and the picture's been skewed so you could see it side by side here, but this is normal asphalt or conventional asphalt on this this uh, side here. Same traffic load on both sides of this, uh, and you could see after 13 years the condition of it. This side over here was done with the rubberized paving section. Even though it's less material, you could see here it's uh, 75 millimeters less than this, it's in better shape after 13 years. And what that 75 millimeter reduction equates to in savings is over 1,350 mixed tons per lane kilometer here uh, by doing this reduced thickness. And if you put a price on that, a savings of over $80,000 per lane kilometer by doing that uh, re reduction as well. And then also there's a tremendous CO2 savings because that that tonnage didn't have to be mined out of the mine. The aggregate didn't have to be crushed, didn't have to be transported. 
fuel wasn't burned on transportation, on heating, on storage and production that way. So very big uh, energy savings here. A durability example here of the rubberized paving. Uh, you can see this section through here. This is uh, the original just normal asphalt that was put down. Obviously they had some base or sub-base problems because you could see the cracking uh, coming back up through, uh, coming through this uh, right away. They put this very expensive SBS polymer overlay over trying to stop that uh, cracking coming up through and as you can see it came right back up through that mat. We went in and did a relatively thin asphalt rubber friction uh, course uh, overlay over the top of it and you can see after eight years in service virtually none of that reflective cracking is coming back up through that mat at all. Uh, several years ago I was um, invited to participate with our United States Federal Highway Administration where they wanted to test modified asphalts in a side-by-side -side controlled environment and we had just uh, sold one of our uh, rubber blending plants to a company in Europe and we were shipping it to Germany out, the, uh, out of the east coast of the United States so we stopped by and we paved the rubber section uh, we provided the bl binder blending uh, and for the paving of the rubber section for them to test and they also had other companies come in and do the other modified sections as well and then they take this big blue apparatus here and they place over the test sections and you can see right here this is a close-up of this uh, this is a super single truck tire weighted down by heavy concrete beams and they place it over the test section, turn it on, and this goes up and back 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, replicating an extremely heavily loaded truck uh, traffic in a very short period of time. Uh, here are some of the photos from the test section. This is just normal asphalt or conventional asphalt here after that tire went back and forth a hundred thousand loaded passes on this. This section here has a little bit of rubber in it. It's called a terminal blend uh, after a hundred thousand loaded passes. This is uh, what, what I mentioned a little earlier, very expensive polymer modified section after three hundred thousand loaded passes. And the section that we did with the rubberized binder material after three hundred thousand loaded passes virtually uh, no fatiguing or cracking at all. And I'd like to mention this was done, all of these were done out of the same hot plant with the same aggregate with the same people doing the paving and the same lay down crew and everything. The difference was the modified binder that we used, ours was modified with the rubber made from the waste tires. The uh, rubberized paving works great. Uh, it does create a safer surface to drive on as well, a little less susceptible to icing, uh, much better in wet conditions as well. This is conventional asphalt on this side. This is the rubberized asphalt on this side. And as you can see, far less sheen, uh, better skid resistance. Again, this is a, a concrete road on this side, rubberized asphalt on this side get far less spray off of the vehicles with it. Uh, just a much sur safer surface to drive on. Also a lot of studies done on noise reduction. Uh, rubberized asphalt or asphalt rubber as it is, is uh, very uh, beneficial in reducing noise as well. Works great in airport, uh, airport settings. Um, it is uh, because of the rubber that we're putting into it. it the, the pavement doesn't age as quickly, doesn't oxidize as quickly, so it stays blacker longer and the markings, the runway markings stay more pronounced for uh, a longer period of time. Uh, this just kind of gives you a, a quick idea of the process uh, we talk about. We take whole car and truck tires, make it into a metal-free and fiber-free crumb rubber material that goes out to the hot plant site and it does require some equipment here we'll talk about a little bit to blend the rubber in with the bitumen to produce the the rubberized hot mix material from there it goes out to the paving site pretty much a normal paving process after that there are a few considerations that have to be taken into account as uh, for because it is a, a modified paving material but you do it with pretty much the same equipment same crews same process but uh, interesting thing to notice here, this is, a, uh, this is a toll road that we did near 
Valencia, Spain with rubber. We do use a lot of rubber in the paving process. For this particular thing, for a two inch overlay here, there were over the rubber from over 2,000 waste tires were used per lane mile for this uh, type of section here. And we have a question from Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia. What size rubber crumb is used for the bitumen paving process? Uh, typically, we prefer about a 14 to 20 mesh gradation. That's something about a one, one millimeter. We have done it with some finer material, have done it with a uh, little coarser material. That is what we see as uh, performs uh, pretty much the best. This is one of our small uh, asphalt rubber blending plants you could see here on this trailer. This unit is designed to fit inside a 40-foot C container, so we can ship them pretty well anywhere in the world, relatively cheap. And then after it gets to the site, uh, to the to the host country, it be placed on a trailer or mounted permanently on a trailer for local transportation. Has a reaction tank up on this end that has augers built into it, rubber hopper that where the rubber feeds into the unit, hot oil heater, self-contained uh, provides all of the heat for the reaction tank, the mixing unit, all of the pumps, all of the piping, all of uh, any of the requirements on here for the process. You can see in these pictures the blending units set up at hot plant site. This is a drum plant site in the United States. The, this is a batch plant site uh, in, I believe this is in Russia actually. Works The equipment, the process works at either type of plant, either, either way. Uh, all types of specialized equipment is built within these plants uh, because it is a very high viscous material. It does require special pumps, special heating. Our plumbing is done in a very particular way. The uh, heat exchangers are required on here. Very, very particular type of mixing unit, high speed, high shear mixing. We do cool this with a chiller system to keep the bearings in the mixing unit cool as well. Uh, the With this type of blending system blended at the at the hot plant site. The crumb rubber has to be delivered to the sites, typically put in the one ton super sacks brought out in truckloads, has to be handled on the site. You can see here this is a blending unit sitting on the site where they're using a reach forklift to put the, the rubber into the into the rubber hopper here. And I have a question from Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is better to use for rubber paving, rubber from car tires or truck tires. We we typically like to see a blend of both, a combination, uh, but we uh, can do it with either one, either 100% car tires or 100% truck tires. But generally speaking, we like to see somewhere in the range of a 70-30, 70% car tire, 30% truck tires as the blend seems to work out a little bit better that way. Now, what we've been talking about all along is the production of the rubberized asphalt for paving or asphalt rubber is the wet process. This is done at the hot plant site, as we mentioned, and does require the special equipment. We've done this very successfully in many countries around the world of, uh, and continue to do it to this day. But now we are affectionately referring to this field blending process as the old way uh, because of some of the new technology that we have recently developed. We produce a pelletized rubberized binder material or asphalt rubber binder material where this product is produced at a factory, at our one of our factories like this, and then it is produced in a pellet form that can be put in the one ton super sacks uh, shipped in sea containers or shipped in bulk to the hot plant site. So we're doing we're doing the all of the blending at a manufacturing site where we're able to create under very tight QC QA basically the same material as you saw in the previous slides. 
and then how this material is used from our plant it would be shipped out and then it would go in the pellet form directly into the hot plant either a drum plant or a pellet or a, uh, a batch plant either one and at the plant then the pellets are blended with the heated aggregate they melt a little bit of virgin oil is added in the process as well and it disperses through modifies the binder and you produce the rubber modified hot mix that way without having to bring blending units to the hot plant site without having to bring the crumb rubber to the hot plant site as well we've done a great deal of testing on our pelletized material we're, we're seeing the same test results as we do with the field blended process. This is uh, uh, our, our paving pellets that we do here. This is some of the testing, ITS and TSR testing, uh, that where we compare it to a modified, a PG modified binder material here. And as you can see, performs extremely well. This is an example to kind of show the economic benefits of utilizing the pellets are which are called pellet pave plus which is a concentrate in our in a paving uh, process here this is uh, an example where we did 6500 uh, 600 uh, 6500 mix tons of mix two different ways to kind of show the application here now these prices here this is based on our base oil which we call a 64 minus uh, 22 base oil and our modified oil here these prices vary quite a bit as does the the, the price of our pelletized material because of the uh, market fluctuations as well but typically right here between the neat oil and the modified oil you see a spread right now of about hundred and twenty dollars per ton this is per binder ton so if you were to do this project with the straight polymer modified 76 minus 22 mix and the mix design called for about six and a half percent you would re use uh, this much binder in, in the mix at this cost so your total cost mix cost would be a little over three hundred thousand dollars for the uh, 6500 tons if you took this same mix design made some slight adjustments for it you would use a base oil here at a lower percentage rate than you do uh, it would only require about 390 tons at the cheaper cost so this is the cost for your base oil we would add approximately one percent of our pellet pave plus concentrate rubber binder material in here about 65 tons of that so your total cost then with the modified uh, pellet modified material is going to be uh, $293,000 so that's a savings cost of a little over $15,000 uh, and so based on this mixed ton we would be saving about $2.35 per mixed ton on a 6,500 ton project so now all of this can vary a little bit these these numbers are going to vary by region by state by country that type of thing but in just about any scenario we can see a rather significant savings with our pellet pave plus concentrate additive as opposed to using a polymer modified material this uh, also opens up um, the area where we can do hot pothole patching with a true hot mix material kind of the same scenario the the pelletized material is used in what we call our asphalt patch master which is a mobile pothole patching unit that it's blended with the heated aggregate at the hot at the uh, repair site in just the quantities that's needed and we're producing a true rubber modified hot mix material uh, that is then used for small utility cut repairs or for pothole patching this can be done in pretty much any weather conditions uh, even in the middle of winter in Chicago you can be out in, in patch with this so there's no more need for temporary cold patches to be used uh, that way you could do it one time even when the hot plants are closed lets a contractor or road agency make a permanent repair again even in the middle of the winter 
We've done the same type of testing, various testing on our patch material, getting tremendous performance results from it that even meet uh, highway specification uh, paving grade materials. And again, this is just with, with our patching material. A couple of shots showing some of the material that's been used. You can see here, this is after one year that the material's been in place, some of the rubberized patches here and here. These are close-ups of these, and as you could see, this uh, reflective cracking or this cracking did not continue on or come back through this repair. Same on this side. Very durable material. No reason to, uh, uh, you don't have, this can be placed one time. You don't have to come back later on as you do with a cold patch or even conventional mix sometimes and uh, do the patch again. Uh, that brings us to the end of our session here. Um, we uh, still have a few questions out there, but I think because we ran a little long on time, I'll probably email those answers. Uh, here you can see all of our contact, my contact information, including our website. Any other questions or anything, we'd be glad to provide any information. Feel free to reach out to me there as well. We really appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, we know, depending upon what part of the world you're in, it could be very early or very late, but we do thank you for joining us. And oh yes, we have one other thing I would like to say. We're having our second annual Recycled Rubber Products Technology Conference. We'd like to invite everyone to. It's going to be September 3rd and 4th, 2014 in Las Vegas, Nevada again. You can go to the website right here and uh, get all the information you need. Sign up for that. So we hope to see you all in Vegas soon. Very good. Thank you all.